Well, this morning we're continuing with our series on the future and the evolution of religion, and we're going to start today with Buddhism. Now, last week I shared some interesting statistics with you, you might recall. They were from a recent survey about the future of religion in America, which showed that 7.5 million people left organized religion since just 2012. They joined the ranks of what are known as the unaffiliate, unfili uh, easy, for, <laughs> easy for me to say, the unaffiliated or the nuns or the spiritual but not religious crowd. Now you have to figure if that trend continues at that rate, it's not going to be long before the largest religion in the USA is no religion at all, none of the above. Now that's what it looks like in this country, in the USA. Worldwide, the story is a little bit different because according to another major survey looking at world religions outside the United States, the major religions, they're going to continue to grow with one exception. Any guesses? Catholicism. Buddhism. Yeah, that's a little shocking, isn't it? I found, I found that surprising. According to a, a Pew Research survey, Buddhism is either going to stay around the same size or it's going to shrink by around a third of 1%. Now they say this is mostly due to low fertility rates um, and aging populations in the largest Buddhist countries. You know what's happening in countries like China and Japan. They've been having these uh, campaigns to keep people to, uh, you know, I think it's two children tops and things like that, whereas the other, the countries of other religions, their, you know, their population growth is going like crazy. And uh, again, I found that, I found that kind of surprising because, um, well, I took it personally, I guess, because Buddhism, <laughs> Buddhism happens to be my spiritual path of choice along with unity. And a lot of you know my story. I uh, was raised Catholic, started out in the Catholic Church. I went to parochial school from day one practically and uh, at one point I was attending a Catholic seminary my goal was to be a priest at one time in my life I was there for about five and a half years uh, before I finally concluded uh, that it wasn't a path for me that was around my early college years and I decided that this idea of celibate priest just didn't make any sense to me <laughs> whatsoever uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a deal killer for some people. Uh, and, 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 and yeah, was, am I getting am I getting the uh, the jazz hands over here? Very good. Yeah. And, and there were other aspects as well, but um, I, I have to say that one of the things that happened to me in, in in the Catholic seminary was that was the place that I was introduced to Buddhism, because they would teach other world religion. Now you wouldn't hear much about it in Sunday during church, at least back in the 70s, but when you were in seminary, you were learning about these other religions. So I was introduced to Buddhism. And I'll tell you what, it was something that really made a lot of sense to me. So I've been uh, studying and practicing uh, the Buddhist philosophy, at least, for close to 20 years now. Um, and the other thing that happened, though, when I was introduced to Buddhism was that it allowed me to be able to make peace with my Christian background. I began to see how the big pieces fit together, and of course, Unity helped to bring that whole thing full circle, which gave me a whole new perspective on how a person can look at the life and the teachings of Jesus. So I am free at this point to be equally informed by any spiritual tradition that offers practical ideas that make sense. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why I found Buddhism to be so appealing, but one of the big ones, believe it or not, is because Buddhism has the best sense of humor. Of all the traditions, Buddhism has the best sense of humor, which may sound odd at first because a lot of people get the idea that Buddhism is all serious and mysterious and it's just not true. Buddhism is full of stories of highly regarded teachers doing wild and crazy and goofy things, saying clever and funny stuff, especially in the Zen tradition. So, this morning I have for you a top ten list of some of the best moments in Zen. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Number ten on the list. Always remember that you are unique. 
just like everyone else. <laughs> Number nine, never test the depth of the water with both feet. <laughs> Number eight, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving, not for you. <laughs> Number seven, good judgment comes from bad experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> It's true, isn't it? Sounds like a paradox, but it's true. Number six, if you lend someone $20 and never see that person again, it was money well spent. <laughs> Number five, it's always darkest before the dawn. So if you're going to steal your neighbor's newspaper, that's the time to do it. I, I said it's practical, right? Next. Give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, and he will sit in the boat and drink beer. All day. Number three, the quickest way to double your money is to fold it in half and put it back in your pocket. Particularly true these days. Number two, a closed mouth gathers no foot. And number one, the most wasted day of all is one in which we have not laughed. Yeah. I believe that wholeheartedly. So there you are, the top 10 list of moments of Zen. So true. And, and, and the real reason I bring those up is because of something that a very well-known Buddhist scholar once said. Professor Robert Thurman once said this. He said, some people think that Buddhist practice and meditation are about stopping thoughts. As the saying goes, if that were true, a coconut would be enlightened. <laughs> Let's remember that upon attaining enlightenment, the Buddha smiled. Yeah. This is very important. He didn't have to smile. He could have grimaced or remained neutral, but he smiled. So the question is, what was it that caused the Buddha to smile? Now, the Buddha was a real person. There are fictionalized accounts of him, but the Buddha was a real person named Siddhartha Gautama. And I like to describe him as a man of extremes. He was born into a family of extreme wealth. He could have lived a life of total luxury if he wanted to, but when he was a teenager, as teenagers sometimes do, he got curious about the world outside the walls of his luxurious palace, so he snuck out one day and wandered around town and he saw that people in the town lived a whole lot differently than he did. He saw that people were getting sick, they were suffering, they were dying. And he couldn't understand why it was that there should be people suffering while there he is living a life of luxury, which then led to this burning question that became his life's work. He wanted to understand the cause of suffering so that he could try to find a way to put an end to it. It's a, very, it's a very compassionate intention, very compassionate motivation. So, again, truly a man of extremes, right? He runs away from the palace, he runs off, he, he joins a group of what are called ascetics. These are, these are holy men back in India who have given up all of their possessions, all of their comforts, in fact, the more discomfort and pain that they could inflict upon themselves, the more spiritual it was considered to be. So they would go without food, they would go without water, they'd sit out in the hot sun, and all sorts of things that brought about a lot of extreme deprivation. So here, here he is. He goes from a life of extreme luxury to extreme poverty and discomfort. Now one of the things that we know for sure about extremes is that they can kill you. Whether it's extreme cold or extreme heat or religious extremists who turn into terrorists, nature tells us that life at the extremes is a lot more dangerous and a lot more difficult and yet somehow we just don't seem to get it. We insist on living at the extremes and as a result people suffer. Siddhartha, he didn't get it either. And uh, his extreme spiritual practices almost killed him. He almost starved to death. So he decided that, hey, this isn't working. I'm no, I'm no use to people weak, sick, and dead. So he decided to get healthy again. 
and he was going to do something maybe a little less extreme, what he called the middle way. He vowed that he was going to sit under a tree, he was going to practice meditation, and he was going to sit there and contemplate until he understood what suffering was all about. And finally, as the story goes, after many days of meditation, one morning he looks up at the morning star and he finally got it. He finally got it. That's when he smiled. That's when he smiled. It was kind of like he was getting the punchline to a joke. After all that meditation, he sat back and he's quoted as saying something, something along these lines. The, the translations are a little bit imperfect, but this is one version of what his realization was. He, he thought, isn't it incredible? All beings have the Buddha nature or the awakened nature. They have the awakened nature, and at the very same moment, I and all sentient beings together enter the way. And so it was all about this idea of lack of separation and that really nothing is missing. Or uh, I think there's another, another way of saying it was that he saw that everything was perfect, whole, and complete, just the way it was. We're the ones who cause problems by the way we think about things. We insist on adding to things or taking things away from what is there. We reject reality because we're clinging to something else. And as we know, that's that clinging and that's the desire that brings about the suffering in the world. The Buddha realized that everything changes, everything is impermanent, and when we go through life thinking that we're going to be able to hang on to something, that causes a lot of problems. So we cause the problems by the way we think about these things. Now all this happened a long time ago. Near as we can tell, the Buddha died around the year 400 AD, and he had a teaching career that lasted around 40 years. Now, now compare that to Christianity. That's a big difference between Buddhism and Christianity. The Buddha had plenty of time to develop a very detailed philosophy of life as well as the practices to go along with the teachings. And, uh, of course, as we know, the most important, the key practice in Buddhism is meditation. Meditation, that's a practice that you find also in other traditions, it's one of those practices that cuts across the religious boundaries. Uh, it's not unique to Buddhism, but in Buddhism, meditation is far more of a central practice uh, than it's been in other religions. That may be starting to change a little bit. We know that meditation, something called mindfulness, is becoming more and more popular. So one of the reasons I'm really surprised to see that Buddhism has such a, a, a lackluster growth rate is because of all the major religions of the world, Buddhism is probably in the best position to offer a non-religious form of its teachings. If that's what people are looking for, if they're shying away from religious systems with its, radic, uh, with its rigid hierarchies and required beliefs and things like that, Buddhism really stands the best chance of offering a spiritual practice that's free of a lot of... Uh, a lot of religious dogma. A great example of how that might look is a book that I've mentioned before. I think it was last fall. We talked about this book called Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. You may recognize the author. His name is Sam Harris, who wrote a couple of very well-known book, uh, books a few years back, called uh, one called The End of Faith, and the other one was called A Letter to a Christian Nation. Now, Sam Harris um, is an atheist. He calls himself an atheist. He generally has nothing good to say about most organized religions. And yet, in the first chapter of this book, which just came out last year, he says this. He says, I had viewed organized religion as merely a monument to the ignorance and superstition of our ancestors. Doesn't pull his punches, does he? No. But now I know that Jesus, the Buddha, Lao Tzu, and the other saints and sages of history had not all been epileptics, schizophrenics, or frauds. He's <laughs> cutting him some slack. <laughs> I still considered the world's religions to be mere intellectual ruins, 
maintained at enormous economic and social cost, but I now understood that important psychological truths could be found in the rubble. It's quite an admission. That's quite a, you talk about, the book is called Waking Up. That's quite, that's quite an awakening. So this book is really an effort to strip away the, the religious trappings from the, the core spiritual and psychological truths that can be found in Buddhism and also in the practice of meditation. Robes, incense, meditation cushions, chanting, bowing, those are all fine if they're meaningful to you, but we also need to remember that by and large they are cultural trappings rather than essential elements of Buddhist practice. Hey, in this country, we sit in chairs, right? We sit in chairs rather than cross-legged on the floor. And meditating while sitting in a chair is just as good as sitting on a cushion on the floor, provided that you don't do it in a recliner. <laughs> I don't know about you, you put me in a recliner and I'm ready for a cold beverage and a nap. That's kind of what happens in that situation. And it's hard to be mindful when you're getting ready to take a nap. But, but meditation works just fine. These are ideal chairs for sitting in meditation. They give you a little lumbar support, a nice even cushion across the bottom. So a lot of the things that uh, come to us in Buddhism are really just cultural trappings. And you can maintain them if you wish. But again, there are some core truths that you can get to. And remember that this is the same journey that Unity co-founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore undertook. They wanted to do the same thing with Christianity. They wanted to get to the, to the core truths that were there while stripping away all of the cultural religious affectations. So um, you don't need the robes. You don't need the incense of chanting to reap the benefits of meditation or as I mentioned, mindfulness, as it's now being called. Meditation, mindfulness, they're essentially the same thing. That's somewhat of an oversimplification, but uh, it's an ancient form of Buddhist meditation practice that's free from the need to have any particular religious beliefs or any kind of dogma or things like that. Now, something else about Sam Harris is that he's a scientist. He's a, he's a neuroscientist. He knows a lot about the workings of the, the brain and the nervous system. And this is how he describes the real life benefits of mindfulness. He tells us that the literature on its psychological benefits is now substantial. There is nothing spooky about mindfulness. It is simply a state of clear, non-judgmental, and undistracted attention to the contents of consciousness, whether pleasant or unpleasant. Cultivating this quality of mind has been shown to reduce pain, anxiety, and depression, improve cognitive function, and even produce changes in gray matter density in regions of the brain related to learning and memory, emotional regulation, and self-awareness. Just lines it right up for us, doesn't he? Here's something else from waking up. A lot of quotes this morning, but it's, 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 it's worth it to just to, to see these insights. You want to talk about how things are evolving in Buddhism. This is a, a really clear example of it. This is something else he says in waking up. He says, although the insights we can have in meditation tell us nothing about the origins of the universe, they do confirm some well-established truths about the human mind. Our conventional sense of self is an illusion. Positive emotions, such as compassion and patience, are teachable skills. And the way we think directly influences our experience of the world. That last one you've heard before, haven't you? An awful lot, right? Right here, right here in unity. That's one of our core teachings. That's one of our core teachings. They're very unity-friendly ideas, but there is one in there, and you may have caught it. There is one statement in there that might create a little bit of resistance. And that's the part where he referred to our conventional sense of self as an illusion. Now, that's nothing new in Buddhism. 
That idea has been around for a long time, that the sense of self is just as impermanent and illusory as things are in the external world. Everything is in a constant state of flux. Nothing is permanent. That's a core teaching in Buddhism. But even though it's ancient in Buddhism, it's something that's just becoming more widely accepted in the fields of neuroscience and philosophy. This idea of our sense of self being an illusion, that's going to be a tough sell for people who carry a strong belief in reincarnation. If the conventional self consists of, and then think about it, when we think of this idea of me, the self, the conventional self, we're thinking about things like my personality, my memories, the memories of my experience in life, my likes, my dislikes, my preferences, and, and things like that. So, if indeed the conventional self is an illusion, then what exactly is it that gets reincarnated? An illusion? Can you reincarnate an illusion? Those are some big questions that arise uh, out of this, this evolutionary model of Buddhism, which really isn't all that new. These things have been part of their core teachings for a long time, but now they're just being brought to the surface. So, that's what we're going to pick up again next week, as we're going to go for one more session on the evolution of Buddhism and look at some of these interesting and perhaps difficult questions that are brought up as we start to come to clarity and begin to verify some of these teachings from a scientific uh, and philosophical standpoint. So hope you'll join us next week as we get into it further. Thank you.